I'm keeping you from a fun after party, so let's, let's just go for it, huh? So in February of 2018, I moved from Austin, Texas to Karlsruhe, Germany to begin a new life as a software engineer at LogMeIn. I'd worked with people from other cultures before moving abroad, but I was really unprepared to join a team with seven nationalities. Then in summer of 2020, I moved to Stockholm, Sweden to join Spotify. And now I get to work on a team with 10 nationalities. So it's even more important that I'm able to communicate and collaborate effectively. And this is because everything that we do from the way that we write our emails to the way that we give someone negative feedback governs the performance of our teams. So understanding how culture impacts our success as a team can drastically improve our day-to-day -day collaboration. So today I'm going to share with you two key areas with which we can decode how different cultures communicate and collaborate to enhance your cross-cultural collaboration. So aside from my own experiences working and living abroad, this talk was inspired by one of my favorite books, which is The Culture Map by Aaron Meyer. And this book decodes how different cultures communicate, lead, and even experience time. So first, we'll examine how different cultures communicate and how we can improve our communication on a cross-cultural team. And second, we'll take a look at how different cultures evaluate performance and give negative feedback. There are several other scales in the culture map that Aaron Meyer discusses, but today we're just going to focus on these two. So before we jump in, Ellie did a really great job. My name is Emma Boston. I am an engineering manager at Spotify in Stockholm. Um, I'm also a new mom, so if you hear a baby crying, that's my kid. Um, she's also the reason I look really tired today. Um, but all jokes aside, raising a bicultural baby has really motivated me to obtain a deeper understanding of cultural nuances. And one might argue that speaking about culture causes us to stereotype people, as opposed to evaluating each person as a distinct individual. And while it's really important that we recognize everyone's individuality, it would be a little bit naive to completely disregard culture altogether. Because when we don't consider the impact a culture has had on someone and the way that they communicate, we falsely view every interaction with someone through our own cultural lens. So let's jump in. Let's talk about communication. So as a US American, when I think what good communication means, I think about someone who is explicit, they express their thoughts very clearly and simply, and kind of redundantly, they ensure everyone's on the same page multiple times. And this is what we call low context communication. So the messages are clearly expressed and they're taken at face value. But not all cultures view these characteristics as good communication. In contrast, many Asian cultures, such as India, China, and Japan, and Indonesia, they value communicators who are implicit. And this requires the listener to actually read between the lines. So this is known as high context communication. The messages are implied, but they're not spoken explicitly. So this is a scale from the culture map, and it's going to plot cultures along a communication scale. So on the left side, we have the low context communication cultures, and the right, we've got high context communication cultures. But an important note about these scales is that the position of a culture on the scale, the absolute position, it's not important. What's important is the relative positioning to your culture that's going to indicate how you perceive someone's communication style. So as an example, the US and the UK are both considered low context cultures. But people from the UK fall towards the right side of US Americans. As a, and as a result, a, man, a US American might find their British colleague to be a little bit vague and not super transparent when they're communicating. But someone from Brazil would view people from both the UK and the US as being overly explicit and low context. So it's relative position, not absolute position, and that's going to indicate how you perceive other cultures' communication style. In fact, the United States is the lowest context culture in the world, and all Anglo-Saxon cultures fall on the left-hand side of the scale. Countries speaking Romance languages, including many countries in Europe, like Italy, Spain, France, as well as some Latin American countries, like Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, fall to the middle right of the scale. And many African and Asian countries fall completely to the right as their high-context communicators. 
And it's important to note that what you consider good communication isn't necessarily what another culture considers good communication. So if someone from a low context culture values explicit communication through verbal and written validation, they might perceive a colleague from a higher context culture to be a bad communicator. And this variation in communication styles can be traced back to the history of a culture. So high context cultures such as China and India typically have a long shared history and they're focused more on relationship oriented societies. So you've got traditions that are passed down from one generation to the next. In contrast, the United States is only a few hundred years old and has been impacted by a multitude of immigrants from all over the world, having different shared histories and different languages. So to communicate effectively, US Americans have to be as explicit as possible. And the language of a culture often reflects its communication style. So in the US, we speak English primarily, and the US is a low context culture. For, they're known for being very explicit. And there are over 500,000 words in the English language. In contrast, France, a more high context culture, speaks a language of only 135,000 words. And this can kind of illustrate how higher context cultures are gonna use less words to convey meaning. Because you have to read between the lines to infer what's meant. Think about two people who've been together for over 50 years. They can probably communicate seamlessly without many words. And in contrast, two people who've only been together for a year or less, they need to be a little bit more explicit in their communication. And again, while you may be considered a great communicator in your home culture, doesn't necessarily translate onto a multicultural team. So when you're working with people from higher context cultures, it's really important to listen. Because communication is not solely about speaking, it's also about listening. So listen to the meaning behind what is said rather than the literal message. And be mindful of the fact that people communicate the way that they're used to. So instead of jumping to the conclusion that an employee or a colleague is a bad communicator, try to recognize that they're most likely communicating the way that they always have been. Now you might assume that the most miscommunications happen between someone from a low context culture and someone from a high context culture. But that's not actually true. Miscommunications happen most often between two people from two high context cultures. This is because high context communication works seamlessly between members of the same culture. But it begins to break down when you have two people coming from two different high context cultures, like someone from Brazil communicating with someone from China. Now imagine we had two couples who'd each been together for 50 years, and you take one person from each pair and you put them together. You wouldn't expect them to be able to communicate as effectively as they do with their partners. So this is why two high-context cultures working on the same team often have miscommunications. So as a result, multicultural teams need low-context processes to ensure that all team members are in alignment. So be explicit in your communication and reinforce key takeaways. Let's move on to the second scale, evaluating someone's performance. While every culture believes in constructive criticism, it's important to note that what's viewed as constructive changes culture to culture. And there are two types of methods for giving feedback. In direct feedback cultures, the feedback is provided at face value. It's blunt, it's honest, it typically speaks for itself. Now when you're receiving feedback from someone who comes from a direct feedback culture, you'll notice that they might use a lot of upgrader words or words that come before the negative feedback to kind of enhance its strength. So words like absolutely, totally, strongly. Now let me tell you, I loved living in Germany, but I must admit the first time I received constructive criticism from one of my German colleagues, I cried and nearly moved back to the United States. <laughs> But in all seriousness, I had a lot of culture shock when I moved abroad because German Germany is a negative feedback culture, a direct negative feedback culture. And the US is much less direct. You might have heard of like that compliment sandwich. Uh, yeah, many people don't love that. Um, this caused some culture clashes with my team members and I. In indirect negative feedback cultures, the feedback is provided much more subtly. The negative message is typically wrapped inside of a positive message to soften that blow. 
So that's that compliment sandwich. Like, oh, this presentation was great. I really liked like your slide themes. Really great feedback. Like you're talking about the presentation aesthetics here. But uh, you know, next time maybe it could have been a little bit slower. Uh, but overall, great job. That's that compliment sandwich um, that U.S. Americans love. Um, yeah, it's uh, confusing for many people, right? And when receiving feedback from someone from an indirect feedback culture, you might notice they use downgrader words. So words that come before this negative feedback to soften the blow. So kind of, sort of, a little bit, slightly. This is a fun guide. It's called the Anglo-Dutch Translation Guide. <laughs> And if you haven't seen it, it's essentially comparing what a British colleague might say, what the British mean, and what the Dutch colleague understands. So uh, with all due respect, the Dutch person's thinking, oh, they're listening to me. This is great. And the British colleague's sitting there thinking, oh, I think you're wrong. <laughs> and if a British colleague says, oh, that's very interesting, the Dutch colleague thinks, wow, they're really impressed. And the, the British colleague's sitting there like, I don't like it. <laughs> so this is just one, like, adorable little example of like cultural mishaps that can happen when you don't recognize how other cultures communicate. So this is another chart from the culture map. We've got the direct negative feedback cultures on the left and indirect on the right. So indirect feedback or I'm sorry, direct feedback cultures like Germany, France, Netherlands give feedback pretty bluntly and you typically state what you mean without any ambiguity. The US, the UK, and Canada fall to the middle right of the scale. You kind of get that compliment sandwich. You balance negative feedback with positive feedback. And then on the right side, we have indirect negative feedback cultures, like Japan, Korea, and Thailand. And things are going to start getting really interesting when we start examining how different cultures communicate with how they provide feedback. So now we can take those, and we can map each culture Hey, Freya, <laughs> into a quadrant of the communication feedback graph. So let's take a look at each of these a little bit more. So cultures that are low context and provide direct feedback, like Germany or Denmark, may appear blunt, offensive, and sometimes rude, <laughs> depending on who's listening. But receiving feedback from these cultures is really straightforward because they value honesty and transparency. And even though these cultures value honesty and transparency, it's super important not to attempt the same method of communication or feedback. Because people in these cultures have long understood the subtle differences between what's appropriate and what's inappropriate. So if you don't understand these nuances, it's pretty easy to, to uh, offend someone from these cultures. Cultures that are high context and provide direct negative feedback, like France, Spain, Italy, Russia, and Israel, speak a little bit more ambiguous language, but still provide direct negative feedback. Now, this is interesting, because as a high context culture, they're taught to read the air. So they interpret what is meant when communicating, but not what's said. But regarding feedback, they're much more direct. Cultures that are low context and provide indirect feedback, like the US, Canada, and the UK, are a little bit weird. <laughs> so how often have you been given constructive criticism by a US American colleague who started off with one or two positive things, slipped a negative comment, and then finished with a compliment, right? That compliment sandwich. It's confusing to many other cultures. And have you ever heard a US American colleague start a meeting with, I'm thrilled to be here with you today. Like, honestly, only a US American would begin a meeting this way. Like, you would be thrilled if you got an all expenses paid vacation or you won the lottery, but are you really thrilled to be doing quarterly planning in Jura? <laughs> so, over exaggerating is really confusing for people from other cultures who are attempting to understand what's actually excellent, what is actually amazing, but what's just good or nice. So if you want to work more effectively with someone from a culture in this quadrant, be explicit with your feedback, but just take considerations to wrap the meaning of your message maybe a little bit softer. And lastly, when dealing with high context indirect feedback cultures like Brazil, China, or Japan, be sure to provide negative feedback in private. You should never give feedback to an individual in front of a group. And there are a few ways to provide negative feedback to people from these cultures. So first, you can give feedback slowly and over a period of time. So it's customary to make gradual references to changes that may be happening. And secondly, you should say the good and omit the bad. Let's take a look at an example. Suppose that your Japanese colleague sends you a 20-page presentation to review. And most of the slides look really wonderful, but the last five look a little bit sloppy. So you can tell them 
hey, the first 15 slides look really great. You don't need to tell them that the last five slides look a little bit sloppy. By omitting praise for the entirety of that slide deck, your colleague is able to read the error and comprehend that the last five slides need to be revisited. There's no need to be direct and explicit with the negative feedback, and everyone walks away with a shared understanding. So understanding how different cultures evaluate performance and give negative feedback can positively impact your efficacy as a team. Today we've taken a look at two of the eight aspects of the culture map. So we've talked about communicating and we've talked about uh, giving feedback or evaluating. Now once we understand the remaining aspects which are persuading, leading, deciding, trusting, disagreeing, and scheduling, we can begin to plot different cultures on the map to indicate where potential conflicts may arise. So you can plot each culture along the eight scales and draw a connecting line that represents the culture's overall pattern. So where two cultures lie really closely together, they coincide within that paradigm. And where they diverge can be a source of frustration, and additional steps may be necessary to facilitate collaboration. So you can see here persuading between Germany and China. Um, China has applications first persuading, and Germany used um, principles first. That could be a source of contention between two team members. But as humans, we're all motivated by the same fundamental needs. But every individual is different. So you should always begin a new relationship with someone from a different culture as a chance to understand their unique aspects. But the culture that we're raised in does have implications on how we view the world. People develop biases about what is considered a good communication and which arguments are stronger than others. And when we work on a multicultural team, it's important to be conscientious of the fact that not every culture experiences life, personally or professionally, the same way that we do. And learning about different cultures can help us to build effective multicultural teams. Thank you.